I would like to introduce uh, Brother Felix Hill. Uh, Brother Hill is a member of Topeka Alumni Chapter, and he is also uh, in law school at uh, Washburn University Law School. And Brother Hill, before you get started, let me uh, also, uh, we have Brother uh, Dominic Calhoun on. And uh, Brother Calhoun, I know your your time is limited. So again, and our deal today is about careers as, as lawyers. And uh, it would take me too long to go through all your list of accomplishments. But uh, if you want to share a few words about, uh, you know, law as a career and also a little bit about your most recent accomplishment. Uh, hey, Brother Burnett, how you doing? It's good to see you. And uh, to all you young kids, man, uh, I just want you to know, Everything is achievable, no matter uh, what you set your sights on. So, uh, Brother Burnett, before I begin, who do we have? Where are they from? They're from all over the country. All right. So, uh, again, I got I got Brother Hill on here with uh, with Peak Alumni. He's at Washburn Law School, and you know I, I want to connect you guys up at some point. But I've got young men from all over the country. All right. So. Uh, gentlemen, let me tell you something. I I come from Texas, a uh, little town outside of Texas, very small, okay? Uh, in my world, no one in my family were ever lawyers. In fact, no one in my family had ever graduated from college, and I'm talking about my grandmother's children. They all potentially went to college, some of them. Um, like my mother, for as an example, she has an associate's degree, uh, but she didn't get that until later on in life. And so uh, there was an opportunity that I had from my teacher in high school because I had never been, uh, no one had ever been to college. I didn't know even how to fill out a college application, pay the fees or anything like that. And so it was my uh, high school teacher that actually did it for me. Uh, she paid uh, the $25 for the application fee. She helped me fill out the documents. And uh, ultimately that's how I ended up going uh, to undergrad. And so I know, Brother Burnett, you have been doing an amazing job with um, uh, Kappa League and God Right for years. Uh, you know that. And when we met almost 20 years ago, uh, Kevin Bur Burnett was doing this same work, uh, educating young men uh, around the country. And at that time, you know, really Richardson Plano. Uh, and that little town I'm from is about an hour and a half away from Richardson Plano. So uh, this work that you've been doing, um, Brother Burnett, I just want to thank you for it, uh, because for you, young men, what you what you don't know is that there's always going to be somebody in your life that's going to give you an opportunity. Uh, the opportunity is where the intersection of your preparation uh, and, and really those um, chances that you're given will give you success. And because I had done all the work, uh, my high school teacher was able to help me. So to be more specific, uh, I had a 4.6 GPA when I was in high school. Uh, I played sports. I was in basketball. I was in the band, if any of you uh, do that. I was uh, the parliamentarian in my senior class. And so I had all of the stuff um, to go. I just didn't know how. And similar to what happened to me, I know some of you are going to be in that same situation. And Brother Burnett is a wealth of knowledge. Uh, so I, I implore you to make sure that you uh, reach out to him and, and stay connected with him because he's helped so many young men uh, go to college, just like my high school teacher did. But uh, to the point of what we're here to talk about today, I went to undergrad. Uh, later, I started my first company when I was 21 years old, and I lost a quarter million dollars, $250,000 I lost. Um, and that was my driving force for going to law school. So I ended up going to law school and um, about 10 years ago, uh, graduated uh, thereafter. And um, when I graduated, I was uh, working with the National Bar Association. The National Bar Association was founded in 1925 and is the oldest and largest association of black lawyers, judges, law professors, and students in the country. And today I am the president of that organization. Uh, I started in Kappa. Kappa gave me my shot. Kappa was uh, the reason why I, you know, began traveling around the country. Uh, all of these programs that you're currently going through, it was Kappa Alpha Psi that gave me that opportunity, and I've just built upon that. 
And um, uh, Brother Burnett, <laughs> Burnett can tell you, uh, 20 years ago, I had braids in my head. Um, and I was walking around, I'm telling you, just like you guys. So, uh, Brother Burnett, I will a pause. I'll take any questions. I know that this is uh, your time, your show. I, I'd much rather answer the questions of the young men here uh, or their parents about the practice of law and what could happen. Uh, but my story is is really simple. I'm, I am you. Um, there is an opportunity for all of you here in the profession. Out of 1 million lawyers, only 5% of them are Black. And less than the percentage of that, uh, two-thirds of them are Black women. So Black men, there is an opportunity for you here. Uh, there's an opportunity for you uh, to practice law, to be successful in it. And I want to help you in any way I can. Um, and so that's why I'm here today. And Brother Burnett, uh, I'm open for any questions that they may have. So gentlemen, any any questions uh, uh, for, uh, for the Calhoun? I have a question. Redrick, Mr. Redrick. Uh, where did you go for your undergrad? Ah, so I went to a small school. It was called Midwestern State University. Midwestern State University is uh, in Wichita Falls, Texas. And so if any of you are from Texas, I'm from a little town called Cleburne. It's about 30 minutes south of Fort Worth. And that is the same school. Uh, Midwestern is the same school that my high school teacher's daughter went to. And so, like I told you, she helped me fill out the application. I didn't even know how to, you know, do any of that stuff. And that's the school her daughter went to. So she said it was a good school. It was kind of resembling of the place that I grew up. I went there. I loved it. I stayed. Uh, I became president of the Student Government Association. That helped me out uh, as well. And so I found some mentors while I was there, and that's why I stayed there. But uh, I know that there are a lot of larger schools, um, University of Texas, Texas A&M. Uh, no matter where you are, there's probably a, a big state system. Uh, but I didn't go to one of those. I went to a smaller school called Midwestern State University. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question. Sure. Mr. Love. Uh, yes. Uh, my question is, what experience do you have that qualifies you for this job? Which job? Uh, being a lawyer. <laughs> ah, so, so, gentlemen, let me tell you what you have to do if you want to be a lawyer. Uh, first step, you got to get an undergrad degree. This doesn't matter what state you, in, you live in. Uh, doesn't matter what kind of law you want to practice, okay? Uh, you got to get an undergrad degree. That is the pre prerequisite for anybody wanting to go to law school. Once you have that law school, that undergrad degree, you have to take a, an exam. It's called the LSAT, okay? And that is your entry-level exam. So if you're ever interested in going to law school, there's two things you have to remember. Currently, and there is some uh, discussion within the bar uh, to change this, but currently, your law school admission is based on two things. One is your undergraduate GPA. How well you do in undergrad is the sole reason that you will go to, let's say, Harvard or Stanford, University of Maryland, University of Texas, wherever you want to go, uh, versus some other school, okay? Your undergrad degree and the results of that score that you got on the LSAT. There's no other real consideration currently today that gives you the right to go into any other school. And you've all heard uh, potentially about the concept of uh, the most recent uh, Supreme Court decision about affirmative action. Is that right? Have we talked about that, uh, Brother Burnett? No, we have not. Okay. And I said, uh, and so the, this is more just a, a career type discussion. So we haven't really talked about any, any right. uh, particular case. Well, the, and we can do all this at a later date, but young men, this is what's important for you. The Supreme Court of the United States has recently ruled that any consideration of affirmative action uh, is unconstitutional. So I want you to understand something. In this country, race has always been a factor, okay? And it, it's just been that way. When the civil rights movement happened in the 60s, uh, late 50s and the 60s, 
there was, uh, I'll call it a reckoning, so to speak, right, Brother Burnett, where civil rights became the focus. And you've heard about uh, giants within our community. You probably heard these names, Dr. King, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, um, Thurgood Marshall. Uh, you may have heard uh, those, those names, Rosa Parks, right? These individuals were instrumental and you're having the ability to go to any school that you want to in America. Now, equally with that, we all know uh, as being young men of color that there were laws on the books and different things that were happening that would prevent you from having access to certain schools. So these schools created programs uh, and different metrics that would put us as black men on equal playing field, okay? And so it would allow them not from, and, and there were various different ways that they looked at this, taking a quota as one example that eventually became unconstitutional, uh, looking at how do we increase the opportunities for black men so they would create pipeline programs, all those things. Those things happen in my lifetime, uh, probably Brother Hill's lifetime as well. You may have, uh, re you know, received a, a benefit from that. Young man, what I'm telling you is that today, the Supreme Court of this United States has said that that's unconstitutional. So for you all, when you get ready to fill out your uh, college admissions applications and all those things, the concept of race is completely out of the window. So you don't have that same ability that I had, the same ability that some of those men on the Supreme Court uh, um, like Clarence Thomas received at the time that he went through. He's one of those ones that said that this is unconstitutional. I'm telling you this because as you matriculate and try to go into college and maybe even a law school, you may have a more difficult time than even I did uh, of trying to get in, okay? So within that concept, this is why the law is so important to make sure uh, that you have that ability. So not only do you have to have that undergraduate degree, you got to take that exam and then you can get into law school. But I'm telling you now, uh, and I know that Brother Burnett is going to uh, bring this in at a later date. Uh, we are working the lawyers around the country and some other activists to make sure you all have the best opportunity to get into whatever college you want to get into. OK, and make sure that you tell your own story without the focus of race, because if you tie it in the race, they're not going to consider those things. So, uh, Brother Burnett, we can hop on another call about that mm -hmm. later. Uh, but it's important for you all to know what's going on in your country and, and why the law matters to you every day. Brother Hill, do you want to go ahead and start your presentation? And, and yep. Brother Calhoun would, would appreciate your remarks, you know, with this as well. I'm at Washburn University School of Law here in Topeka, Kansas. Um, Washburn is famous for its litigators that are come uh, for the lawyers that come out of it for um, Brown v. Board of Education. They argued both the district court level, the circuit court level, and all the way to the Supreme Court level. And I was very excited to be a part of that. Um, and that's what it's famous for. They just built this $37 million law school, and it is breathtakingly beautiful. I'd encourage you guys, if you're in Topeka, give me a call. I'd love to show you the building. It is absolutely stunning. Um, so uh, I see the ages here, 14, 17, 16. I saw two 15s, I think. There's a bunch of you guys on here. So the question is, um, am, am I too young to talk about law school or to think about law school? And there's a quote from Henry Ford. He says, if you think you are, then you are. And if you think you're not, then you're not. And uh, there's a story out of Texas, the South Texas Law, uh, law College in Houston, a school that I used to be a part of. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, a city I used to live in in Houston. I lived in Houston and Dallas. And um, there's this 19-year-old, uh, became the youngest lawyer to graduate from the South Texas College of Law, 19 years old. So if if you think you're too young to go to law school, I, I'll agree with you. And, you know, if you think you're not too young, I, again, I'll agree with you. And so um, how you do that, though, you got to be very strategic in, in how you accomplish that. Now you say, okay, um, uh, Brother Dominique said you got to have uh, a four-year degree and you got to, you know, take this this very difficult test. I thought at least it was. And you got to have some recommendations, a resume, this and the third. And um, he is. 
hundred percent right. So this is the old uh, pole mark for Kappa. Now the pole mark, I'm sorry, the, how do, give me the correct title, Brother Burnett. The. It's the Grand Pole Mark. Grand Pole Mark. I'm so it's sorry. Past yeah. Grand Pole Mark now. Pa pa yes, sir. Past Grand Pole Mark. So he was an attorney. Um, I'm sorry. He is an attorney. Yeah, um, and there are a ton of, a ton of Kappa attorneys uh, uh, within the organization. So to get into law school, you got to have a bachelor's degree in anything. And I want to stop right here and talk about this. When I say anything, I mean anything from an accredited college. Now, um, you can go the, the, the normal route of getting a, a bachelor's degree that'll take you four years to do and you go to college and you take the summers off and, you know, um, you can do that. Um, I'll tell you how I did it. I got my bachelor's degree in less than six months. So from the day I signed up for classes to the day I graduated, I did it in six months. I did it with an online school that's fully accredited. It's called Western Governors University. Can you guys see me right here? It's called Western Governors University. It's fully accredited. It's recognized by the American um uh, American Council of Business Schools. Uh, it's recognized by the uh, Law School Admissions Council. Um, it's recognized everywhere. Uh, it took me about six months. All I did was take classes online. And within six months, I was done. If you want to go that route, it's more than more than acceptable within the industry. Um, there are some advantages to going to a, a top tier college within the state that's uh, very much so recognized. But for the sole purpose of getting into law school, this right here will more than satisfy that requirement. Um, and uh, it was very cheap. I think I paid right at $3,000. It was 100% out of pocket and um, I got it done. Um, I also went back to school to um, earn a few more graduate degrees in both business, accounting, finance, and statistics, but none of that was required to get into school. Literally this one certificate that took me six months to do, um, is what the uh, the law school admissions council um, says um, required. And that's what I did. And so uh, if you want more information about that, reach out to me afterwards. I can get you set up. And if you just need to check that box that they require, I will have you check. I will let, um, go ahead. Were you about to say something? Okay. Uh, if, if you if you need assistance in checking that box, I will more than happily give you some direction on that. It is It was extremely difficult. I won't say it was easy. Because uh, you're learning things that you don't know. Um, but my, my bachelor's degree is in accounting. I have master's degrees in accounting, finance, and business. And um, and so it just kind of worked with the nature of what I was doing. Um, the next is the LSAT, the law school admissions test. Um, the, the score range is from 120 to 180. So 120 means you got zero questions right on the exam. And 180 means you got all of the questions right on the exam. Most law schools, I would say probably more than half, you have to score no less than 148. And between 148 and 168 will pretty much open up almost every door except for maybe the top 25 schools in the country. Um, and we'll we'll talk about that in a second. But a 168 is pretty good. 170 is, that's impressive. I will say I scored a 152 on the exam. And I mean, I probably got accepted in every law school I applied to. Um, and then you need two letters of recommendations. If you know enough CAPAs, you can get that very easily. A personal statement needs to be well-crafted. I did recently learn that they actually read those. And um, uh, your resume, which will probably just consist of what you do um, within your organization, at school, what you're a part of, maybe what you do in your church. If you're a member of your church, if you're in the choir, add all that in there. It shows that you're willing to do things that are you don't necessarily get paid for, but that because you want to be a part of the, the community you're in. And you need an LSAC account, which is the Law School Admissions uh, Council account, which is, um, I think it's about $150 to set it up. And again, if anyone needs any assistance with any of this, reach out to me directly. And I promise you, I will get you a uh, where you need to be with this. Okay, the next step, is there any questions on this? If you got questions, put them in the chat if you don't wanna uh, raise your hand. Okay, perfect, I'm gonna go to the next step here. Next step is how do I pay for law school? Now, um, I don't know if you guys have, uh, uh, have heard some horror stories, but I've seen people pay upwards of $300,000 to go to uh, law, college, law school. Uh, it can get expensive. It can get very expensive, though. Um, the cost of a house um, can be the, the price someone pays for tuition. 
Now, there's a few ways you can do it. Now, I did it the pre-law price weight. And I separate these two because um, there are, there is a unique distinction between how you fund the law school program. The pre-law is um, you go through the military, you get the GI Bill benefit, and then from there, the military pays for all of the law school. You need no loans. They give you money every month while you're taking classes so you don't have to work. That's the process I went through. I served in the Navy for six and a half years. Absolutely love my time there. Um, and um, it's just a great way to pay for law school because it's it's all hands off. You file one piece of paper with the financial aid office and you're done. The VA takes care, take, takes care of everything. The second way is scholarships. Now, scholarships come in a variety of different flavors and a variety of different sizes and prices and sources and awards. And sometimes you got to, I know a guy <clears throat> in my school, in my, in my year group in law school, um, he got 57 scholarships for $1,000 here, $500 here, $100 here, $10,000 here. And it added up so that where he didn't have to, he's not paying for um, anything out of pocket. It takes a lot of work. You got to network your behind off. You got to meet people. You got to get out of the house, out from in front of the computer. You got to go out and talk to people. Um, you, you might have to volunteer with organizations. You might just need to meet people and impress on them um, that you want to go to law school, that you want to be a part of the deciding factors of society. Um, and then there is the next step is pay as you pass. So a credit hour, law school is... Uh, is um, uh, is divided up in credit hours. So for most law schools, you need 90 credit hours. Some of them are like 91, some are 88, but within the range, 90% of them are 90 credit hours to pass. Um, well, you take one class that's three credits or four credits, you would pay whatever the cost per hour is. You take that class, you pass the class, and then you go take another one. And you pay as you go and you don't take out any student loans. And um, that's definitely a way to do it. Um, most people will take two or three classes at a time versus a full slate of classes throughout the year. And um, um, uh, it's just a, a way of knocking it out, um, you know, one step at a time. And then there's student loans, which, you know, can be very problematic. Uh, once you sign up for a student loan, that is yours until you pay it or until you die. So just be very careful about that. I would not recommend that to a lot of people. It seems very, very, excuse me, predatorial, um, the way the interest rates work, the way um, the the loose lending standards are set up. And so if you got to take a student loan versus dropping out of school, take the student loan. But understand that that is real money that you will owe with interest and it is very, very dangerous. It should be taken with a lot of consideration. Now, the post-law way is I graduate from law school, I go work in the military as a judge advocate general. Uh, if you do that though, uh, they pay for all the student loan debt. Uh, so if you if you took out loans and then you went into the military, they absorb, they <clears throat> they assign the student loans that you had to the United States government. It's a great way to do it. And another way is the public loan, um, I'm sorry, the public service student loan forgiveness. If after you graduate law school, you pass the bar exam and you become a public defender or a prosecutor or a city attorney or some other qualifying activity, um, once you do that for 10 years and you make 120 monthly, I'm sorry, 120 payments, that's 12 months, one 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 payment a month for 10 years, um, the, the loans that you have are forgiven. So the next slide, here we go. Um, so there we go. So in my estimation, this is my research when I was uh, applying for law schools, um, it came down that there were two types of law schools. There were schools in the top 14, and then there was the, 100 and, um, the remaining 182. When I was applying for school, um, Washburn uh, accepted me and they called me and said, hey, you should really come to Washburn because we are um, uh, one of the top 200 law schools in the American Bar Association. And I was like, really? That sounds amazing. And then I asked them how many how many law schools were in the, the ABA and they said uh, 196. So that was a little, <laughs> looks like all of them were part of the top 200. <laughs> so, um, but just understand that um, if you're not in the top 14, you're in the um, 182, and there's no distinction, I don't think at least, amongst the, the remaining. I will tell you traditionally, um, HBCUs, the six HBCU uh, law schools are traditionally a lot easier to get into. Um, and that's Florida a and Law, TSU in Houston, Texas Southern, Southern University in uh, Louisiana, Howard Law in Washington, D.C. And I think I'm missing one. Um, the HBCUs are a little bit easier to get into. 
the admission standards are slightly lower. And um, and my experience with, uh, at least my understanding with people with HBCU experiences, they're a little, a little bit more enjoyable. So take that as you will. Uh, next here, so representation. So um, this, <clears throat> this upper um, circle right here, the circle slide, um, I think Brother Dominique said that less than 5% of all lawyers in the United States are Black. And um, and this is data coming directly from the uh, American Bar Association. Um, this is an interesting statistic because it talks about Black people, but it, it seldom makes a distinction amongst Black men and Black women. Uh, Two-thirds of all Black attorneys are, um, are Black women. And uh, that's a challenge in itself. And so what I would like to see is more Black men as lawyers, as judges, as leaders, um, as lawmakers. And so, you know, just keep that in mind. Places, if you look at this little map of the United States at the bottom, uh, the bottom right side, uh, it says lawyers per 1,000. And this is sort of a, a very loose, I want to emphasize, very loose mes metric by which they measure, okay, where is the demand for lawyers? So the lighter that um, the state is, the the less lawyers and the darker the state is the more lawyers they have now new york because new york is such a financial hub within the country they're going to have way more attorneys um uh so many more companies are headquartered out of new york city and um um and massachusetts so you're just going to have a, a higher concentration of corporate law uh, but if you look at kansas which is where i'm located um um there's a massive demand uh, and there's an extreme shortage of, of attorneys. It seems like all of them want to be New York, California, and Texas, which, I mean, it just means that there's more opportunity for you if you want to be in the rural side of uh, uh, of the country. Um, and then on to the left right here, you'll see this bar graph that shows the massive uh, disparity amongst uh, representation in law firms that are partnerships or associates within the firm, um, yeah, massive. It's been growing. I will say uh, it's been growing steadily, but still a massive appreciation um, for uh, or a massive um, um, uh, difference amongst uh, white attorney or white partnerships and uh, and um, uh, and associates and, and black ones. So um, right here, let's talk about the future. Now, th this is a this is a um, a graph that represents the age of the workforce. So the blue ones represent the ages of attorneys, and this is in two thousand and twenty two. I'm sorry, two thousand twenty one data. And the the orange represents all the other um, um, people in the United States workforce uh, collectively. Uh, as you will see, though, that there is almost no attorney in the 20 to 24 range um it starts to uptick in the 25 to 34 and then the 35 to 44 range right here you see the most representation now this 55 to 65 group let me explain this these are attorneys who are for all intents and purposes retired they seldom do any work they're on the golf course but they're still lawyers and they're still calculated into this uh this uh this statistic and the reason i show this is because if you look at it there's a lot of opportunity to get involved within the industry and really make a name for yourself because in 10 years everybody in this group right here and the 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 35 to 44 group will be in the 44 the 45 to 34 group and everybody in the 25 to 34 group will be in the next quadrant and so you're coming up behind them. This is what we refer to in statistics as a leading indicator. And it shows that, you know, there's room definitely for you to get into this industry and really make some good money at it. And this right here is a trend that shows the median age of attorneys. So the word median means that if you were to line everybody up from its youngest to its oldest and find the middle number, that's what this is measuring. So not the average, but just who's in the middle and at what age. And as you can see, we we saw an uptick um, in the early 2010s, and now the age is steadily de decreasing. And um, yeah, like I said, if, if you come in early, you can make a lot of, you, you have a lot of opportunity for growth and a lot of opportunity to make some really good money and an opportunity to have some fun within this field.
And finally, I want to talk about the consequences. So if you don't become an attorney, all right, um, we get situations like this. This is uh, the Citadel Alumni's Board of Visitor uh Board of Visitors members named the first African-American military judge in South Carolina history. This is the first Black judge they've had in the history of the state. Um, I'm sorry, military judge they had in the history of the state. Now, this would have been fine if it was 1995. This article came out in 2021. 2021, they're still getting the first Black something, which, which, which says that uh, not a lot of Black men are going into this field, which means you don't have the representation within this industry. And that that burden, whether you created it or not, everyone on this call, uh, it rests on your shoulders. I'm not talking responsibility. I'm talking about impact here. So just keep that in mind. And I will say this. I'm, I lived in uh, Houston, Texas for um, about six and a half years. And in 2018, we had um, we had 18. Uh, I'm sorry, we had 19 uh, black women run for judge, and all 19. I'm sorry, 18 out of 19 of them won. Uh, and this is a photo of them uh, of the 18 girls who won the judgeship. Six of these girls went unopposed. Unopposed means nobody ran um, against them. That means they went to the uh, election office, wrote their name on the ballot. And even if they didn't get a single vote, they would have still been the judge. And I asked this question, you know, confidently, where, where are the black men at? Where, where, where are the black men at, at as judges on here? Certainly, I'm not saying that there, there aren't any black male judges. I, I, that would be absurd to insinuate. Uh, but when this many women can um, become judges and a third of them run unopposed, you know, that says that there's definitely a, a need uh, for for more Black judges, and I would argue more Black male judges. So that's that's the presentation I got. I'm open for any questions. I'm going to force two people to ask a question. Um, Cameron Sanders, are you still on? Yes, sir. All right. What 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 question you got? I'm forcing you to ask one, okay? Okay. Um what uh well this is just a question so um what inspired you to become this what inspired me yeah what was your like motivation so two things one is selfish and one is more um you know more grand the first one was i just wanted to make more money i'll be honest oh, with you. okay um you know some of the highest paid people in the country are attorneys and uh i i just want to make more money uh that that was probably the the driving motivation and then secondly you know i um i was reading some criminal justice statistics and um one of the things that they talked about was that um if there's one one a single black prosecutor in the prosecutor's office there is a difference of I'm going to get a little bit more statistical on you. There's All less right. standard deviation and difference amongst the sentencing guidelines that a person gets if they go to jail. And that's massive. That can be eight years um, in some, some situations. Dang. So uh, just put the presentation in. Okay, gotcha. So, gotcha. So, um, so, do we, so do we have any other, can we, I want to see if anyone wants to step up and ask a question. <laughs> We have any other questions? questions. Sir? I have a question. Can you turn your, can you turn your camera on? My camera doesn't work. Okay. Go ahead. Um, what do you enjoy what? most about your career? Well, I, I'm actually still in law school. Um, I don't graduate until next December. So I don't really uh, have anything to say positively about law school, except that there's a lot of reading. Let me show you guys a book that I have to read. This is one of about 40 different classes you have to take. This book is massive. And you spend anywhere between seven to eight hours a day just reading. And um, um, probably four days a week, if not five. It's a lot. It's it's a lot. And so, um, you know, get used to sitting down and reading because that's what it takes to be um, to be in this uh, uh, this industry. So, Ismail... What you got? 
Hello. My Hello. question was, were there any disadvantages of doing your um, six-month undergraduate degree? I can't find one. I looked. I looked hard. I looked real hard. I couldn't find one. I couldn't. It was cheaper. It was faster. I didn't spend a lot of time. Um, I've, I've been searching for a disadvantage. If one is out there, I'm, I'm asking you to come find me because I can't find a single one. I, I still pledge Kappa. I pledge Kappa in law school versus being an undergrad. So I, you know, and um, uh, Brother Burnett was was there at the pledge ceremony with me. So, um, yeah, I, I can't I can't find a single disadvantage to doing something faster, cheaper, and more efficiently. And what was the name of the law school again? I mean, the undergraduate school that you went to. It's called Western Governors University. Okay. And if you if you send me a if you send me an email here, I'll put my email in the chat box. Um, if you send me an email, I will get you set up, and um, I will I will give you one of the secrets to getting the price a little bit cheaper, almost a thousand dollars cheaper. So. Um, Shoot me an email. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Who else got questions? Um, I got a question. So What's you up? said that you got to read, you know, those thick books throughout the days, yep. like eight hours. How do you absorb all that information? Um, you read slow and then you read again, and you 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 cut the TV off. And you delete TikTok from your phone as much as I miss it. And um, um, you say that this right here is more important than everything else. And that's what you do. And as far as absorbing it, if you do something enough, you'll figure it out. And I, I hate to give you an answer like that. I'll tell you, I detest it when people answer my questions like that. But you just got to do it, man. Um, and that's what it is. Uh, do you take notes while you're reading? I do. I take notes. <laughs> um, right now, I've been, so I started in January. I've probably got just under a thousand pages of notes right now. So um, I type so much that my hand starts cramping right here. So, <laughs> so that's what it is, man. You, you, got, you just got to do the work. There's no substitute for it, you know? Was there any uh challenges you faced? Sure. Uh, challenges I faced. Uh, was there any challenges I faced? Nothing that nothing that I couldn't like figure out. Like once, like here's the thing: once you say in your head, like I'm gonna do this, everything else becomes. I'm not say easy, but it becomes accomplishable. Does that make sense? Like once you say I'm gonna do it, then like everything like and now it's just about putting the piece of the puzzle together. Like oh, I need to call this person to get a letter of recommendation, or oh, I need to study for the LSAT. Let me go buy this book. And if anyone is serious, I have I have an LSAT training book that that is current for this year. I will give it to the first person that emails me and asks me about it. Uh, it's like a two hundred dollar book. I use it. Um, and uh, and the first person that get uh, asks me for it, you can have it. I'll I'll mail it to you, uh, UPS. Um, but once you just like make up in your mind, like, I'm gonna do this. Everything else is easy. It's easy, you know. Get getting the undergrad degree becomes easy because it's like I'm gonna do this. Getting into law school becomes a little bit more easy. It's still a it's a daunting task, nonetheless. Um, what type of law are you studying? Um, the the American Bar Association does not make distinctions amongst law within law school. So once you graduate from law school and you pass a bar exam, you can do any part of law that is available to practice. At least that's my understanding. So like if I plan to go into criminal prosecution um, when I graduate, but if you know I wanted to go into banking and finance law, you can do that too. If you want to go into Oil rights, you can do that too. If you wanted to go into uh, social media uh, um, uh, legal uh, representation, then you could do that too, you know? What you got? Yes, you, Dominique. Harris. Was it fun? Was what fun? Uh, law school. It, well, it would, is it fun 
I mean, um, yeah, it isn't fun. Uh, it, it's not fun. It's not. I will just be honest with you. I don't think it's fun as much as it is like. Uh, I will. I do say. I will. I do wake up excited about going to class. So I, I will tell you that fun probably wouldn't be the word to describe it. Um, but I'm definitely interested. Every day is like this new concept of law that you learn, and it's exciting. I will say. How many classes did you take? For law school or for, for school undergrad? Or for undergrad. Law school. You take about 35 classes. Yeah. Yeah. Plus or minus a few, because it, it's not necessarily about the number of classes, it's about the number of credits. Go ahead, Noel. All right, so uh, more of a personal kind of a question and whatnot. Uh, when you were in law school, did you manage to like connect with some of your peers and whatnot? And along with that, do you still talk to them to this day? Well, I'm actually in law school right now. Oh, my fault. Sorry. But uh, I've got two line brothers that cross with me in law school with me. Okay, that's good. That's good. So, yeah. Got it. Just was asking mm -hmm. about that. That's all. So I'll, I'll take, uh, we'll, we'll take one more question from anyone. So Go ahead. how would you sign up to take the LSAT? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, assuming you already have a bachelor's degree in anything, um, you would go to the um, Law School Admissions Council mm -hmm. website. So if you Google, if you type in a uh, law school applicant or a law school application, it'll be like the first link that pops up. And um, if you, uh, um, then from there, you would go through, go through the props. It'll set you up an account, set up two-step um, authentication, I think. And uh, you'll go through and start putting all your information in. Thank you. But the name is the Law School Admissions Council. So, uh so again, I want to thank everyone for for getting on, uh, Brother Hill. I want to I want to thank you. So with that, uh, I'm gonna and and again, one of the reasons I think uh, this is important and and law is important is because uh, of all the things that are going on in the world, you have an opportunity to make an impact on it. While I'm not a lawyer, but you know, equal rights, representation uh you know social media rights uh what's going on with artificial intelligence uh software and technology everything has uh, has law involved in it so uh again it's an excellent way to make an impact on uh the lives of everyone and uh, provide a good future for yourself so uh with that brother hill you want to close this out with any uh last minute comments yeah, I, I just want to say in, in closing, if in your mind you decide you're going to do this, your age doesn't matter, how much money you got doesn't matter, where you're located at doesn't matter. I'm going to go so far as to say the grades you have in school right now do not matter. If you make it up in your mind to do it, it that's half the battle. So if you say to yourself, I'm going to be a lawyer, then everything else has a tendency to just work its way through it. Um, and, and so don't be afraid of whatever, you know, you think that's a limiting circumstance for you getting to this point because half the battle is, is saying to yourself, I'm going to be a lawyer. So, and I, I'm right in the thick of it. So I can tell you from experience, that's all I got, brother Burnett. Thank you. And thank you, brother Hill. And uh, thank you young men uh, for joining. Uh, this concludes our program. And uh, again, uh, we'll look forward to doing this again.